Coming up on the Mindful Midlife Crisis. This person was my spiritual teacher and the person that I was going to for support on my own inner journey. And it was three years of this person planting seeds that I look back on now and go, oh my God, I didn't see that. I didn't see that at the time. But pulling me out of relationships, telling me that they weren't right for me, telling me that I deserved better, telling me that I was this, you know, amazing woman, goddess, you know, embodied, all sorts of things, like really building me up in one way, but pulling all these other people out of my life in another way at the same time. And then eventually having me enter three years later, entering into a romantic relationship with them where they had gained my trust. And within three weeks, it was, if you really love me, you'll do this for me. If you really support me, you'll do that for me. If you're not willing to do this, it's because you have this trauma that I know about because I confide, you know, I confided in, in him so much. It's because you had this trauma in your life when you were younger and it's holding you back from being able to move forward in your life and actually be the partner that you say you want to be. So all of a sudden I'm like, well, you're right. Like I did have that trauma and maybe it is holding me back because I was somebody that was committed to my personal development. I was somebody that was willing to look at myself and he had built trust with me over time. So I believed him. Welcome to the Mindful Midlife Crisis, a podcast for people navigating the complexities and possibilities of life's second half. I'm your host, Billy Lahr, an educator, personal trainer, meditation teacher, and overthinker who talks to experts who specialize in social and emotional learning, mindfulness, physical and emotional wellness, cultural awareness, finances, communication, relationships, dating, and parenting, all in an effort to help us better reflect, learn, and grow so we can live a more purpose-filled life. Take a deep breath, embrace the present, and journey with me through the Mindful Midlife Crisis. Our guest today is Janine Faith. Janine is a narcissistic abuse recovery expert and survivor of abuse. After going through her own trials with narcissistic abuse and meeting her mentor, she went back to school to receive her master's in psychology and has done over five years of private mentorship in behaviorism, attachment theory, and narcissism so she can help her clients heal and reclaim the truth of who they are after narcissistic abuse. She is here today to share her story and give listeners a step-by-step journey to healing and reclaiming their lives after narcissistic abuse. So welcome to the show, Janine Faith. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here, Billy. Yeah, it's a lot of fun having you here. Narcissistic abuse isn't a fun situation, but it's fun for me to talk to you because when we kind of did our pre-call before, I was like, oh, this woman is a force of nature. Thank you. So... (laughs) Yeah, you really are. You have a very strong presence about you, and I'm really excited to get into this conversation. But before we do that, I'd like to have our guests talk about the 10 roles that they play in their life. So what are the 10 roles that you play in your life? The 10 roles that I play in my life are really, well, obviously I'm a business owner, right? I'm a woman. I'm a friend. I'm in love with books, so I consider myself a book nerd. I obsess over antiques, specifically in the Art Nouveau, Art Deco area. I'm a swing dancer. I sing. I've had a long history as a salesperson. I love to cook and I travel around the world. So those are some of mine. I'm sure there's more, but that's a good place to get started. Yeah, that's a very Renaissance woman of you here. You, there's a lot of there's the books, there's the swing dancing, there's the singing, there's the traveling. There is a zest for life and all of that. And you have some rather unique experiences that we'll dive into here in a little bit too. As far as being a friend, why are you looking forward to being a friend in the second half of life? You know, I love this question specifically about being a friend because after everything that I've been through. What I've really found is the way that you can cultivate friendship is really the most important thing that you can have in life. Romance often can come and go. Family is what we've had growing up. Friendship is a place where you can go deeper in different areas than you would in romance. 
And so I've really enjoyed the friendships that I've developed over the past couple of years. And I'm really looking forward to those friends being like family for me throughout the rest of my life. I was actually curious if being a friend was related to your own experience. And it it very much sounds like that. It's something that I learned along the way through both my training and, you know, my own personal healing. It's just the way that you can find people in your life who are your people that are friends that can be there, that can fill many different types of roles and different personalities that you can trust. I just think those people are irreplaceable. We're going to talk about your experience here and you've talked about, you're going to talk about the relationship that you have with your mentor. And now (laughs) you too are a mentor and you're looking forward to being a business owner in the second half of life. What excites you about the work that you are doing to the point where you're really looking forward to the prospects that the second half of life has to offer business wise? Well, if I'm able to help anyone the way that my mentor helped me, that for me is probably the closest thing to my heart. And that's what my business is, right? So anytime that I think about my business growing, the impact that it can have, and how any man or woman could heal in the way that I did and have someone stand by them in the way that my mentor stood by me, you're lucky I'm not crying already. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, when you think about the impact that a person can have on your life, right? Especially if you have gone through something traumatic, just having that somebody who believes in you or having that somebody who helps you heal. And I imagine the healing process has to come from first recognizing a need to heal, recognizing that you deserve love, that sort of thing. And it sounds like your mentor has helped you through that. And you in turn then are extending gratitude to your mentor by helping others navigate through it too. And I relate to that quite a bit because that's why I'm starting to become a certified mindfulness teacher because my therapist introduced mindfulness to me and my way of extending gratitude to her for the life-changing experience that she provided for me is to learn more about mindfulness and to share it with others. And I imagine that's why you're growing your business with that approach, that mission in mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have incredible gratitude for my mentor. His response to that is consistently, you're the one that did the work, right? And I totally understand and appreciate that because you can't change someone's life without their permission in that way. So I definitely feel incredibly grateful for him. And then also kind of like laugh in my head when I talk about it, because I know that should he listen to this podcast later, he'll just be like, you're the one that did it. You know, you're the one that showed up and did the work because there's only so far anyone can go right to help you, you know, if you're not willing. Well, when I described you as a force of nature, I think your next response right here suggest like why you left that impression on me because one of the roles that you're most looking forward to in the second half of life is being a woman Mm. and so there is a strong sense of feminism right there (laughs) in that so why are you looking forward to being a woman in the second half of life well i think knowing myself as a woman is what leads me in every other area of my life right Knowing myself as a woman is what allows me to be a friend. Knowing myself as a woman is what allows me to be a business owner that can help and mentor other people. If I don't have a sense of who I am in myself, then I can't lead others in the way that I want to in my work. And I can't show up as the friend that I want to be also. Because if I don't know that, then I might be compromising myself. I might go into people pleasing. I might you know, hide some aspect of me. So the more that I can be who I am as a woman and be really honest about it, I think the more those in my life will benefit from from having me in their life. I imagine that then comes back to just uh, the real necessity to do the work to really understand who you are and understanding the why of of who you are. A hundred percent. And it doesn't stop, right? I didn't get to a place where I'm like, oh, I'm healed. I'm done now. <laughs> right, right. There's it, a continuum of right? ev- the evolution, right? I always talk about reflect, learn, grow. And every day mm-hmm. is an opportunity to reflect, learn, grow as we continue to invest in ourselves. 
Absolutely. And we all know that as we age and things change and life changes and life happens to us, we have more opportunities to learn who we are and who we want to be. We could change our mind, right? There might be something that we were interested in at one point in our lives. And as we grow and age and mature, it's no longer interesting to us. It's played out. Right. So I think you always have to be spending time getting to know who you are, whether that's your what your interests are or who you want to spend time with or how you want to spend your time or just understanding the nature of your own thought process and why you make the choices that you do. There's a lot to explore. And we're going to explore all of that here. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're going to talk to Janine about her experiences with narcissistic abuse and how she now helps people navigate through the healing process of narcissistic abuse. Thank you for listening to The Mindful Midlife Crisis. Thank you for listening to The Mindful Midlife Crisis. If you're enjoying what you've heard so far, please do me a favor and hit the subscribe button. Also, giving the show a quick five-star review with a few kind words helps others find and benefit from this podcast just like you are. Finally, Please spread the wealth of free knowledge and advice in this episode by sharing it with the people in your life who may find this information and my mission to help others live a more purpose-filled life valuable. My hope is that these conversations resonate with others and inspire people to live their best lives. Thanks again. And now, back to the show. Welcome back to the Mindful Midlife Crisis. We are here with Janine Faith, narcissistic abuse recovery expert and survivor of abuse, you can go to her Facebook group, which is Designed to Love. So you can check it out there, see if that's for you. So before we get into your story with narcissistic abuse, you have had a couple of interesting life experiences that I do want to dive into a little bit here. So can you tell us about your time as a dominatrix and your time as a shaman? Because those seem like two very different worlds <laughs> right there. Like they are on two ends of the spectrum. I'm curious how those shaped your relationships in moving forward. And I'm also curious if you see parallels in those experiences in the work that you do now. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah, let's talk about that. So <laughs> let's start with the dominatrix piece. That's something that I explored over 20 years ago, right? So it was a long time ago for me. That world, and you know, we hear about it way more now than we did back then, especially with, with the rise of the internet and everything. That's something that people are more familiar with. But it's changed a lot. And it was something that I explored because I was around it a lot in the bar scene. I was a bartender. I lived on an area of Philadelphia where it was kind of prevalent. So I got exposed to that world and got the opportunity to train in it. And then ultimately was like, I don't think I want to do these things, (laughs) right? It wasn't really the right fit for me. It was more attractive to me because it seemed sort of like an interesting thing to do. It was maybe kind of glamorous. The women that I knew that were doing it were making a lot of money at the time. So I was drawn to it for those reasons and ultimately did not find what I was looking for (laughs) in that area. So what is the training like? What is the curriculum for a (laughs) dominatrix? It's what I'm very curious about this. As an educator, I want to know what is the curriculum that is involved in being a dominatrix? Sure. So what I actually did was I just spent time with a woman who was a dominatrix and she took me with her to her different sessions and showed me how she did things. It might be very different now. I'm sure it is, but that's all it really entailed at that time. And she just introduced me to a couple of different people that could have been potential clients. And like I said, ultimately, I decided that there were aspects of that that weren't right for me and didn't really pursue it for any considerable amount of time. What were some of the aspects that made you uncomfortable? Why did you feel like it wasn't for you? I don't think for me, the world of kink or dominance in a way that hurts people is something that I'm interested in, right? It's just not something that I think I could stand in a room and whip someone, for example, that for their own reasons is enjoying that potentially and has asked for it. But I think I would stand there and be sad. (laughs) Right. So it really wasn't the type of thing that I felt comfortable with because I wouldn't actually want to inflict harm on someone. And that was a lot of what it was. And that for me wasn't 
what I kind of had, I don't know what I thought it was going to be like. Again, I was in my very, very early 20s. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what I thought it was going to be like, but I found out very quickly that that wasn't something that I could do and keep a straight face and not get upset. And well, I want to circle back around to that point here after, after you share your story, but you also told me that you were a shaman. So what was that experience like? Because I know that that has shaped (laughs) your attitude towards energy work. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm happy to talk about this because I think that what you don't know until I say this is how significant this is to the narcissistic conversation. Oh, I did not know that. So this would be good. Right. So the way that I got into shamanism and started participating in that work was as a result of having gone through so much manipulation by the person that I was in a relationship with that I had actually changed my own personality, which is very common when you're dealing with somebody who's going through narcissistic abuse. I changed my own personality so much to try to become like this person because that is what a narcissist tries to do. They try to get you to become just like them, like a mini version of who they are and conform to all of their thoughts and ideas. And because of that, I started to do that. And that is how I started practicing shamanism. That is such a powerful statement right there, because as a dominatrix, you had such self-awareness that you knew that this was not for you. Mm -hmm. And you and I have had a little conversation about just kind of your overall impression about energy work and that sort of thing. And Mm -hmm. I imagine that maybe some of that is a byproduct of being subjected to something that you were manipulated into. But then the power of narcissistic abuse is that you at one point in time had such self-awareness that you knew that this wasn't for you. But Mm -hmm. as a result of the narcissistic abuse, you gravitated towards something that just was not for you, and you continued to pursue it until you realized, oh, wait, I need to get away from this. This is not for me. I need to heal from this. Right. And it's an interesting thing with narcissistic abuse, right? Because it's subtle. People think, oh, why would you ever be in a narcissistically abusive relationship? Why wouldn't you just walk away? We hear that all the time, right? With most abuse, we hear that. And we hear it even more often with narcissistic abuse a lot of the time because if there's no bruises, right, people don't really understand what's happening. And psychological manipulation is a really powerful thing and it starts really, really small. So when you're dealing with somebody that you trust, that you think you can believe when they say things to you and then slowly they just start tearing down at who you are and make you believe that who you are is not worthy and then start trying to mold you into who they want you to be. So with hindsight being 2020 and the healing process that you've gone through, what's the story then of your narcissistic abuse journey? Like, you know, what were some of those microaggressions of psychological abuse that this person used and how did that impact you and how did it change you? Because, I mean, I feel like impact and change changes the result of impact over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I initially met my ex through a new age community, right? So what ended up happening was I was going through a divorce and I was going through a divorce because I knew that I wasn't happy and I was trying to find answers about who I was. And the thing about a narcissist is that they are very good at taking advantage of people who are going through transition. So a lot of the time, if you talk to somebody that's gone through narcissistic abuse and you ask them to go back to the time where they met the person and you ask them what was going on in their life, there was some sort of something happening, right? Some sort of transition in their life that they were going through where this person came in and took advantage. So in that very beginning phase, I mean, this person was my spiritual teacher and the person that I was going to for support on my own inner journey. And it was three years of this person planting seeds that I look back on now and go, oh my God, I didn't see that. 
I didn't see that at the time. But pulling me out of relationships, telling me that they weren't right for me, telling me that I deserved better, telling me that I was this, you know, amazing woman, goddess, you know, embodied, all sorts of things, like really building me up in one way, but pulling all these other people out of my life in another way at the same time. And then eventually having me enter three years later, entering into a romantic relationship with them where they had gained my trust. And within three weeks, it was, if you really love me, you'll do this for me. If you really support me, you'll do that for me. If you're not willing to do this, it's because you have this trauma that I know about because I confide, you know, I confided in, in him so much. It's because you had this trauma in your life when you were younger and it's holding you back from being able to move forward in your life and actually be the partner that you say you want to be. So all of a sudden I'm like, well, you're right. Like I did have that trauma and maybe it is holding me back because I was somebody that was committed to my personal development. I was somebody that was willing to look at myself and he had built trust with me over time. So I believed him. I am blown away at the long game. The patience to build you up for three years and then engage you into a romantic relationship. Like, I'm out after like a week if somebody dies. <laughs> that is incredible to me, the amount of patience that... And, and I'm almost speechless to the point of that. So then, is he doing this to other people during that time without your awareness? 100%. A hundred percent. So the thing about it, right, is you're like, oh, he played the long game, right? Like he was playing the long game with probably 10, 15, 20 women. He was in a relationship at the time, right? So there was no reason for me to suspect that he was interested in me romantically in any way. Matter of fact, he'd make a point of saying that he wasn't, mm. right? So, but he was just planting the seeds, planting the seeds, planting the seeds as a narcissist does so that they will always have supply. So I just happened to be there at the right moment at the right time when he wanted it, he had already planted the seeds with me. But if it hadn't been me, it would have been someone else. Right. And, and within as, two weeks. Yeah. As I was explaining the patience part, it dawned on me like, oh, like, I mean, he wasn't playing the long game. He was just waiting for you to be vulnerable enough to be lured in. Meanwhile, he was already working the angle with somebody else who had already, you know, fallen prey to his charms, that kind of thing. Absolutely. And planting the seeds with other people at the same time. So by the time I left the relationship that he and I were in, he had someone else within two weeks. So how do you get out of that relationship? How does that relationship end? For me personally, I found an article on the internet. I still have it that had a list of 20 different behaviors that you'll find in a narcissistic person. And I read it because I'm curious and because I like psychology and that was part of who I am anyway. And so I opened it up and I'm reading it and I'm going, check, 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 check. And it was one of those moments. And a lot of people have this moment, like after they leave this type of relationship where you go, Oh, that's what's happening. Because it's not that you're in the relationship and you don't realize there's a problem. You're not naive to the fact that there's a problem, but you're working to solve it. You want to rebuild the relationship. You want to make things right. You want to find a way to be with the person and have everything be happy and calm. And they're always moving the cheese. So, you know, it's confusing because you're like, I'm trying to do the work. I want to show up for my partner. I can't make this work. I've done all of these things. I had done so much stuff. Like the list of things that I had done to try to make this relationship work is insane. And nothing changed. Nothing I ever did changed the way the relationship was happening. And all of a sudden, when I found out, I was like reading these, this list of things, I went, oh, that's why. And it's never going to change. And so for me, it was that moment. It was like all of a sudden I had all the puzzle pieces. I could see the whole picture and I realized what was happening and I was planning my exit strategy. Now it took me, 
probably six months before I fully and completely left. It took me some time before I actually got on a plane, flew away. It took me another three months before I went no contact. How long were you in the relationship? I was in the relationship uh, almost three years to the day. Yeah. So what is that three-month communication like after you leave? And, you know, how do you instill the fortitude to stand your ground? Because I imagine that you're going through this transition and there's a lot of uncertainty in there. And so you could go back to what's comfortable, even though it's incredibly uncomfortable, but it's what you know. So how do you manage the fortitude to say, you know, I'm sticking to this, even though I imagine those that communication, he's trying to lure you back in? Absolutely. So the first time I left, I went back after six weeks. Mm-hmm. So I left about midway through and I did go back and I believed that it was going to get better. This time that I left, I was just done. And I think part of it for me was that I knew why. So in my mind, I knew that it was not going to be able to change. And that supported me. But at the same time, what was happening was I was still getting frequent emails and text messages and and do this for me and do that for me. And I need your help and I need this and I need that. And then I didn't talk to him for a little bit because I told him I needed time to heal. And then I started talking to him again. And then In that process, it was like, hey, I want you to come on this trip with me and I want us to heal together. And I've been doing my inner work and I've been looking at things and I realized where I went wrong and I've really changed and I want to make this better. And my question was, well, what changed? Like, what did you realize and what do you think has changed? And his answer was completely inadequate. It had nothing to do with what had really been going on. He told me something like he was working too much. And not giving me enough attention. And I was like, well, that wasn't really the problem. (laughs) And so I very kindly said, you know, I don't think we're good for one another. I don't think that this is the right fit. And I don't want to try to reconcile our relationship. And he went completely off the handle, right? And then it was, I'm angry. It's all because I have anger issues. I need to see a therapist. There's something wrong with me. I don't know how to heal. I don't know how to move on. And It was in that moment of that personal attack when I had been kind that I just knew there was just no way. Like I was just done being treated that way. Now I know it's a lot harder for other people sometimes. I know that people feel really bonded and then they miss the person and the intermittent reinforcement that often happens where they give you criticism, 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 and then all of a sudden you have a good day. And then, you know, and then you feel good. And then they criticize again and everything gets ugly again. And then you have another good day. Makes you like you're chasing almost like an addiction. It makes you want to chase the connection for when it's good again. And that's done intentionally in the relationship, right? To keep you going. So not often when people are leaving, they are experiencing that push-pull feeling of, oh God, I miss them, I want to be with them, I want to be with them, that feels like an addiction, and it's very, very hard to go no contact. So I actually teach people ways to go no contact so that they can have a plan for when that urge comes and actually enact the plan to support themselves so they're not trying to figure out how to convince themselves not to do it in the moment of feeling like they want to. I imagine... I mean, you almost have to go cold turkey rather than wean yourself off, because if you wean yourself off, the dangers of being lured back in with just that one right comment exists right there. So it's just got to be straight, no contact, which you likened it to an addiction. You go through the withdrawals, right? Mm -hmm. And just how much that impacts you physically, emotionally. I feel like that addiction analogy is dead on because you are, you're right. You're chasing that dopamine fix. Cause mm-hmm. I don't know if this was a narcissistic relationship that I was in, but I was in a relationship with somebody who, if I were to say like, I felt emotionally abusive and that's what I was chasing was the good times. And so I would push through all of the times that this person made me feel like shit 
in hopes that we would get to back to a good time, back to a time when we were, you know, feeling good about being in a relationship with each other. So there are aspects of it, not to the extent that you faced, but there are aspects of that that connect to my own relationship there. And there was a lot of residue from that. And I imagine that's very much what you went through. And after you went through that, it's almost like you became a student of human behavior as a result of, like, you wanted to learn more about this. So can you talk a little bit about the work you've done to better understand narcissism and what you've uncovered about human behavior in that research? I know a big part of that has to do with your relationship with your mentor, and you've mentioned him a couple of times. So can you talk about what role did your mentor play in helping you heal? Hmm. I mean, he is the reason I healed. And to be perfectly honest, when I left the relationship, I didn't know how bad things were for me. I didn't realize how lost I was. I was so relieved to be out of the daily abuse and to just be living life on my own terms that I didn't realize how devastated I was and how impacted I had been and how much my personality had changed and how much self-worth I had lost. Because in my mind, I had clawed my way out of that relationship, right? With the fire that I have inside of me. Like you say, I'm a force of nature. Like that is me, right? Like there has always been that part of me inside of me. And I use that to get myself out. And so in a way I was proud of myself. I was happy to be gone. I was several thousand miles away. I had friends around me. I had family around me. And it wasn't until I started traveling around Europe by myself and I was at a festival and I ran into my mentor. I just, I mean, it was just call it dumb luck, call it God's grace, depending on what your belief system is. I met him and he was able to see in me that something was wrong. And the way that he identified that was through behaviorism. Because the way that I was speaking was not in alignment with the way that I was responding to different scenarios or the way that I was moving. So he was like, there's an incongruency here. That's interesting. Why is that there? And so we developed a relationship and through that, there was the healing process, right? So I learned initially through my own experience and then through more formal training with him. It was tough because trusting somebody after you've been through narcissistic abuse is insanely difficult. For me in particular, trusting a man was that much harder because what does this person want from me? I was just going to say that, like, I got chills just thinking, oh my gosh, like, what if this was part two? And I well, imagine that there was apprehension. I mean, mm -hmm. there has to be, because once again, he has to build trust in the same way as your abuser did, in the sense that he's not in the same way, but is building trust right. with a different I can purpose, tell, you know? Yeah, I can tell you how he did. How? So, because he understood one of the things that he implemented immediately was a refusal to see me in person. So our entire relationship during that time was conducted through email, if you can believe that. It was done over email and he would not see me in person to demonstrate to me what it meant to have a powerful boundary. Now, I didn't know or understand that at the time. I know that now. I did not know that then. But he held such strict, strict boundaries with me to demonstrate that and to also show me that there was nothing that I could give to him. He didn't need anything from me, not even my physical presence as a friend. And that's how I came to know that there was no way he was going to take advantage of me. And then alongside of that, Every single thing he taught me, he'd send me studies. He'd show me evidence. He'd tell me to research it. He'd tell me to verify everything. It was like, I'm not here just 
telling you what my opinion is. Like, these are the facts. This is how it works. And so because I am who I am, and I'm like, okay, well, let me read, mentioning the book nerd thing Mm -hmm. earlier. Right, right. Because I'm that way, and because I was hungry for healing, and I felt like in my core, even though I was terrified many, many times in the situation with him, I was. I was genuinely scared that he might be taking advantage of me in some way or manipulating me in some way. There was something inside of me that said, no, this man is helping you. And I would just go and I would do the research and I would look and I would verify everything that he said. And I'd be like, okay. So over time, he's the person I trust most in the world now. It's so interesting that the email piece helped you trust him because that would have been a huge red flag for me because I would have just thought like this person's catfishing me. But you had met this person in person originally and then they had set this boundary so oh, so fascinating because i imagine that especially for your survivors that you're working with that for you you know how do you build that trust in them and how do they allow that trust in you too so that's so fascinating to me So I think we'll do this. That's a pretty intense story right there. So we'll take a quick break. And then when we come back, we'll get some more answers to those questions that we just asked. Thank you for listening to The Mindful Midlife Crisis. Thank you for listening to The Mindful Midlife Crisis. New episodes come out every Wednesday to help you get over the midweek hump. If you'd like to contact me, or if you have suggestions about what you'd like to hear on the show, visit www.mindfulmidlifecrisis.com and click Contact Us. While you're there, don't forget to sign up for the newsletter. You can also click on the show notes for links to the articles and resources we reference throughout the show. If you want to check out my worldly adventures, follow me on Instagram at mindful underscore midlife underscore crisis. My hope is that my trials, tribulations, and successes will inspire you to take intentional action to live a more purpose-filled life. And while you're at it, remember to show yourself some love every now and then too. Thanks again. And now back to the show. Welcome back to the Mindful Midlife Crisis. We are here with Janine Faith. And Janine is a narcissistic abuse recovery expert. She just shared her story of surviving narcissistic abuse, her recovery from that. And she is here today to share her story and give listeners a step by step journey to healing and reclaiming their lives after narcissistic abuse. If you want more information from her, you can join her Facebook page, which is Designed to Love. So narcissism has become kind of a buzzword here. Mm -hmm. And so when we talked to Dr. Lena Haji, she mentioned that, and she does this thing called Trendy Term Thursday, right? Where she talks about these words that are overused. And she talked about how only 1.6% of people are actually like diagnosed narcissists, right? So why are we seeing words like narcissist and gaslighting, which was Merriam-Webster's word of the year, so often? And how does that then dilute the conversation or does that actually bring more awareness to it? There's a lot of pieces in this, Billy, like a lot of pieces. So I think one of the reasons that we're hearing so much about this is because of social media, right? Social media has actually been a contributor, according to studies now, to an increase in narcissism. And so not only are we seeing people become more narcissistic because of social media, we are also have the ability to share this information widely. And now people are grasping onto manipulative behaviors and then labeling them as being narcissism. So I think that's a lot of what's happening where someone will go, well, he cheated on me, he's a narcissist. Or she cheated on me and, you know, she's a narcissist or all sorts of different things. Like they were gaslighting me. Well, gaslighting does not automatically equate to somebody being a narcissist. It's a behavior that can happen in narcissism, but it does not automatically equate to that. So I think the conversation is bringing awareness and awareness is important. However, When we call people narcissists that are not narcissists, we give permission to people who are actually narcissists to behave in even more extreme ways, and it can be extremely dangerous, and we need to be careful. How so? 
Because it gives them permission, right? So they see, oh, gaslighting, everybody gaslights. Everybody gaslights. Everybody does these toxic behaviors. Everybody blame shifts. Everybody triangulates. And so they can escalate their behavior because it's being normalized too much. Oh, interesting. Interesting. So then, you know, let's kind of set the record straight here. What are some of the characteristics of a narcissist and what separates a narcissist from your run of the mill asshole? Sure. So (laughs) there's nine qualities that define somebody with narcissistic personality disorder, right? So there are going to be grandiosity, fantasies of unlimited power or ideal love or success, right? Beliefs that they're special and they can only associate with special people. They require excessive admiration. They have a sense of entitlement. They have a, like a lack of empathy, which is something that is, I think, one of the hardest things for people to understand. They're envious of others or they think people should be envious of them. And they have arrogant kind of haughty behaviors, right? So those are the DSM criteria, right, for uh, narcissistic personality disorder in combination with like it has to be negatively impacting somebody's life as well, which is hard to determine. And do they need right? all nine of those characteristics or do they need four of the five or one of the nine or what? what? Five or more. Five, five or, or more. more. And you'll find a, most of them. I, in my experience, when I, people start talking about it, I'm like, oh, check, 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 check. I haven't heard very many people with like only three, but that's just me personally. <laughs> and to be very, very clear, I do not diagnose narcissists, right? That is not what my role is. That is not what I do, but I'm familiar with, with the, what is required. and. The thing is, people mistake, like I said, gaslighting or blame shifting or toxic behaviors, some of these things that can be associated with trauma as automatically being a narcissist. And it's usually people who have the trauma can change. They can get help. They can go to a therapist. They genuinely apologize. They realize that they're wrong. They experience guilt. A narcissist doesn't, right? They're not walking around going like, oh, I shouldn't have done that, right? Like they see you crying and they're like, yes. Whereas somebody that's toxic and a jerk might in that moment might be like, say they don't care and then come back an hour later and just be completely humiliated by their own behavior. A lack of Mm self-awareness. Got it. So, you know, one thing you mentioned there is the feeling of grandiosity, right? And on your Instagram, well, actually, I want to talk about your Instagram and your TikTok a little bit because you have an Instagram, you have a TikTok, and you have your Facebook group. I was telling you, I like to research my guests. It is really hard to find information about you. And you said that that is very intentional. So can you talk about why is that intentional? I imagine it very much has a lot to do with recovery. Yes, and just protection in general. If I'm going to be working with people who have been in a relationship with a narcissist, and should that narcissist happen to break into their Facebook or their Instagram or their TikTok and come across me and gather my information, that could be a dangerous situation for me. So it's important that I protect myself. Have you run into situations like that before? Or because you are so intentional, have you avoided that? I have avoided that. I'm very intentional. It's not that I haven't seen people trying to get into my world that are still in relationship in one way or another with my ex. That has happened. I'm aware of it. And so I don't know for those reasons too. Like I don't ever know when something could come back around. I don't know if he could hear me on this podcast, right? And then all of a sudden I'm under fire again. It's entirely possible. So I do what's necessary for me to protect myself. Understandable, understandable. And dozens and dozens of people listen to this podcast. So... (laughs) 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 But going back to what I was going to ask before, you'd mentioned Mm -hmm. grandiosity, right? And your bio Mm -hmm. on Instagram reads that you help high earning men and women pick up the pieces after narcissistic abuse. Do you find that narcissism is more prevalent 
in financially successful people or and maybe not even financially successful people, but just successful people in general, because the reason why I ask that is I'm wondering if there's some truth to this idea that their narcissism is what drives them to be the best or drives them to be successful, quote unquote, because then they can control the outcomes at all costs. Or am I conflating bravado with narcissism? Well, in that situation, so a narcissist can be of any level of intelligence and any socioeconomic factor, right? So it's not that we see it with more high earning people necessarily, right? It can be anywhere because you have to figure a narcissist comes into the world just like anyone else with their personality, right? With their environment, with their parents, they become narcissists. And that could mean that they're smart. It could mean that they're average. It can mean that they're lower level of intelligence. It can mean anything, right? So the reason that I specifically focus on high earning survivors is because I find that those are the people who are less inclined to talk about it. They have more shame around it for some reason. They feel like they have more to lose because of whatever their status might be. Like if we were to hear that some high level CEO were to come out and say that they were narcissistically abused, like what would happen to them in their professional life, the communities, you know, the country club, people don't believe they look the other way. Oh, but your life looks so great. You had everything, you had the money, you had, you know, maybe the fame, whatever it might be. And so it just becomes this thing that people don't talk about. And then we make this really big deal about it, right? Like when we see celebrity people come out and talk about abuse, we're like, oh gosh, look at the, you know, and really it's, they're not different than anybody else, but they are often less supported in what their experiences are as a result. So I specifically speak to that to try to give a safe place for people who are higher earning to feel like they can come and talk. So one of the things that you recognize in your dominatrix days is that you didn't want to subject people to that pain, that humiliation. And I was going to ask you like about the power dynamics, because there's a power dynamic in being a dominatrix. There's a power dynamic in narcissism. And I was curious what kind of the relationship between the two were. <laughs> and you just shut that down right away, because the answer to that is what? Consent. Yeah, it was so simple that it didn't even register with me, right? That, yeah, in that power dynamic in the dominatrix, you're consenting to that behavior, whereas in narcissism, you're not, right? So then when you look back at like, I don't want to treat people this way, do you say to yourself, I allowed this person to treat me for so long? Or... Because you talked about guilt and shame. How do you perceive that? How do you look at that? Because, like I said, you're very much this force of nature, and you had these boundaries in place, and then this happens to you. How do you reflect on that? How do you process through that? And how do you help people navigate those emotions of maybe guilt and shame so that they realize this wasn't your fault? Mm -hmm. So it's a really great question. For me personally, now I look back and I say, what a great experience. (laughs) Look at how much that taught me. Look at how much that taught me. Look what I get to do in the world now. Look at the path that it's led me down. I may not have met like my mentor, who's one of the most important people in the world to me now. Like I wouldn't change anything at this point in my life in terms of what has happened. So one of the first things that I do when I work with people is what I call the research phase. And the research phase is actually learning how strategic narcissists are, learning to identify their strategies, understanding how to identify manipulation when it's happening, how it happens, and be able to be prepared for that for anything in the future. Now, what happens when you actually learn the behavior of a narcissist is you start to see all the different things that you went through that you didn't realize that you went through. 
I don't want to say nobody ever blames themselves for that, but there's a huge awakening into the, holy crap, I had no idea. Like I had no idea. And you can see how somebody got past your boundaries. It doesn't mean that you won't have sadness about it. It doesn't mean that you won't have shame about it. But when you can see it so clearly later and you realize that you didn't know and there was no way you could have known, it relieves some of that pressure that you put on yourself. And the reality is that people who have really gone through narcissistic abuse are already blaming themselves anyway. I mean, that's what happens the whole time. So just we have to take the time to unravel it. You provide this research for your clients. You had this article and it was this awakening but I imagine people are so manipulated that they don't even recognize that they're in that situation. That article very well could have just fallen on deaf ears, so to speak, right? When you read it, you're kind of giving me like, no, I, I don't uh, know. But so, I don't know. Were you so far along within it that you were just exhausted and you're like, there's something here that I can't put my finger on. And then boom, this article shows up and you're like, oh, it's this. Whereas maybe if you had received that article two years prior to that, you might have dismissed it. No, I think I would, if I had seen it two years prior, I think I would have known. Interesting. You're living it, Mm -hmm. right? So it's one of those things where I've never met anyone that was in a narcissistically abusive relationship that didn't know there was a problem. Every single person I've spoken to knew there was a problem. They just didn't know what it was. Maybe they'd never even heard of what narcissism was, right? They'd never heard the term narcissist before. They didn't know it meant something that was diagnosable, right? They thought it was just like, oh, that person's, you know, arrogant. Like they didn't really know. And so they're having this experience. They know something. They they always know that something's wrong. I mean, always is an exaggeration. I can't say that. But they know that something is wrong most of the time. They just can't put their finger on why. That's most often what happens. So I don't think there's very many people that are in the relationship completely blind to the fact that there's a problem. It's just that they don't know what to name the problem. And often they don't know how to leave or they're terrified to leave. So it sounds like a well-written research article is more powerful than a friend saying, hey, this is a bad situation right here. Because I know that you kind of got disconnected from friends, it rather intentionally. Did you have friends saying, Janine, this, this dude's no good? Oh my God, everybody. Right. So <laughs> everybody. then how come that falls on deaf ears and this article resonated with you? Is it because the article had the language to accurately identify the specific behaviors that you were experiencing? For me, yes. Because when friends were saying things to me, or family even, my response to it was, well, they just don't know him and they don't understand, right? Because there was a disconnect, right? They weren't spending time with him. They didn't know him. They weren't around. So it was like, oh, well, they just don't get it. They just don't understand. They're not here. And so I was able to dismiss that. But when I could see, like you said, the very specific behaviors, and then that question in my mind of like, what is wrong? Like, why can't this ever get better? Like, why doesn't this ever get better? When that question was able to be answered, it made sense to my mind in a way that I personally needed. Like, I needed to have that answer for myself to be able to take the action that I needed to take and leave. So we've talked about the action that people need to take in order to leave. What steps do you take to help people pick up the pieces once they've left an abusive relationship with a narcissist? You talked about you have them do the research. What are some of the other components of the work that you do? 
Yeah. So the research is where we start so that they understand fully how to protect themselves. Because when you can understand fully how to protect yourself and you know that you can keep yourself safe, you can actually go deeper into the part where you have to go into acceptance. So here's a question about that. Do you find recidivism where people were in a narcissistic relationship and then they're more susceptible to falling back into another narcissistic relationship? 100%. So talk about that because I was going to ask you, is there a personality type? You had talked about people who are, you know, kind of in a crossroads in their life or in a transition or in a vulnerable place. Mm -hmm. I imagine people pleasers, people who don't have a lot of boundaries are very easy. I hate to use the word targets for narcissists, but I imagine that's kind of who they are able to draw in more easily. I would call these people the feelers. So empaths and feelers. Okay. Yeah. So people who process information through their emotions could be more susceptible. They're not the only people that could be manipulated. People can be manipulated in all different ways. It's finding someone's weakness. But often when I'm talking to people, I find that there was guilt or they felt bad in a particular type of way. And that's part of what kept them going. But people can be manipulated in all the different ways that we process information. There's no limitations there. But I do see people who get compromised emotionally a lot. And you are more likely to enter into another narcissistic relationship if you've had one, because it is the comfort and familiarity that you experience and you don't know how to identify it. It's already gotten past you in some sort of way. So then you, in a sense, are the safety net to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So I had cut you off there because you had said something that that I really wanted to get the answer to. So then continue on with those steps. Yeah. So the research, like I had said, is the first phase so that they can really understand how to protect themselves because they're able to identify it. And they are also able to create a strategy and a plan for how they'll take care of themselves if they're in that experience again so that they can feel like they're safe. Then we go into the stage where you're in acceptance and acceptance is where the grieving process happens and you start looking at what you've actually gone through and really fully accepting that the person that you were with is a narcissist. It's one thing to say, my ex is a narcissist and it was hard, and but to really fully accept it, you have to be able to admit to yourself how manipulated you were. You have to be able to admit to yourself that the relationship that you thought you had was a lie. You have to be able to admit to yourself that you loved that person, but that person did not ever love you. And all of that is really painful. And there's a lot of grief that comes with it. And there's the time lost in a relationship with somebody where you could have been with somebody who really did love you. You could have been alone and loving yourself, right? There's time loss. There's a lot of people, you know, have children with narcissists. So there's all of that that has to be navigated. There are people who, you know, spend years with a narcissist and don't have children. And then those days have passed. I mean, there's so many different things that can happen that you have to grieve. Acceptance and grieving is the hardest and longest part of the healing process. So you go through that. (laughs) So I'm going to get you out here on this. I am a believer that forgiveness is overrated. I though imagine that part of the acceptance is forgiveness of yourself for being in the relationship. That sounds very victim blame. You can figure out a better way to say that, but just to forgive yourself for that situation, but not forgive the person for the abuse. Am I right in saying that forgiveness is a bit overrated in terms of forgiving others for our own healing? And then the reality is if we accept and forgive ourselves, that's when the real healing begins. I would agree with that. I don't think you need to forgive the narcissist in your life. That's not a requirement in order to heal. It's a personal choice. And some people do and and some people don't. I think in terms of forgiving yourself, I think I've said that. I don't know that it's fully the term that I would use. So much as understanding yourself, right? Like when you actually grieve and then you start to understand what happened and the way that it happened and the manipulation that happened, 
through that process because is a huge self-awareness that develops. And when you start to understand yourself, you can start to then accept yourself as well and know why you do the things that you do. And that is where I think if there is forgiveness, forgiveness happens, if there's a need for it. Janine, this was such a fascinating conversation, and this is why I was excited to have it with you. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. This is so valuable, and I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much for having me, Billy. I hope I get to come back again. Absolutely. We will make that happen. Hey, if you enjoyed this week's episode, be sure to look in the show notes for all of Janine's contact information. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple listener, you can do that by clicking the plus sign in the upper right-hand corner. Also, please do me a favor and leave a five-star review with a few kind words. Or if you're a Spotify listener, click those five stars under the show art after you click the follow button. If you'd like to share your thoughts on this week's episode, you can find all of my contact information in the show notes as well. Feel free to email me your takeaways from this conversation at mindfulmidlifecrisis at gmail.com. You can also follow me and DM me on Instagram at mindful underscore midlife underscore crisis. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Just look for Billy Lahr. It's L-A-H-R. Or you can send a message through the contact page at www.mindfulmidlifecrisis.com. While you're there, feel free to sign up for the newsletter so you can get access to the free meditations I send out every single Sunday. Finally, I know Janine and I would greatly appreciate it if you would share this episode with the people in your life who may benefit from her expertise and life experiences. The purpose of this show is to help you navigate the complexities and possibilities of life's second half, and we hope this conversation provides you with some insight to help you reflect, learn, and grow. So with that, for Janine, this is Billy. Thank you for listening to The Mindful Midlife Crisis. May you feel happy, healthy, and loved. Take care, friends. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the Mindful Midlife Crisis podcast. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If this episode resonates with you, please share it with your family and friends. We will do our best to put out new content every Wednesday to get you over the midweek hump. If you want episodes to be downloaded automatically to your phone each week, all you need to do is hit the check mark, subscribe, like, or follow button, depending on what podcast format you're using. While you're at it, feel free to leave our show a quick five-star review with a few kind words so more people like you can easily find our show. If you're really enjoying the show and you want to help us out, feel free to make a donation to www.buymeacoffee.com backslash MMC podcast. That's www.buymeacoffee.com backslash MMC podcast. You can also access the link in our show notes. We use the money from these donations to pay whatever expenses we incur from producing the show. But ultimately, we record this show for you. So if you keep listening, we'll keep recording and releasing new episodes each week regardless. If you'd like to contact us or if you have suggestions about what you'd like us to discuss on future episodes, feel free to email us at mindfulmidlifecrisis at gmail.com or follow us on Instagram at mindful underscore midlife underscore crisis. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to the articles and resources we reference throughout the show. Thanks again for listening. May you feel happy, healthy, and loved.